<laughs> hello, everybody, and hello, Susanna. Hi, thanks for having I me. I call you Susanna. That's fine. <laughs> um, and you are uh, a poet. I am. So my first, real first question for you is, when did you look at your, yourself in the mirror and say, I'm a poet and I know it? I did. <laughs> uh, I don't think that moment has arrived yet. Okay. Uh, I think that every time I sit down to write a poem, I hope that I can. And if I get one done, I feel pretty lucky and grateful. Um, and I keep working on that. I think being a poet is a ongoing commitment to writing poetry. And that's the thing you do every day, or not every day, but a lot over time. And you are appearing um, as part of the Midnight Sun Visiting Writers series, a yes. long time, a long running series that the English department, the communications department bring um, celebrated writers up to talk about their work and to read some of their work. And you're gonna be reading tonight on the Fairbanks campus. Yes. At seven o'clock in the Shy Ball Detroit. Let's get that stuff. Right up. Um, so what is it? There's lots of ways to experience poetry, especially in the digital age. You can look at it on a screen, you can look at it on a printed page, or you could go hear it uh, and hear the, the poet um, perform their poetry themselves. For you as a poet, what's the difference for the audience um, engaging with your work in those different ways? Well, I think when you're reading something on a page, as a reader, you're the one that's in control. Um, you decide kind of when to stop, when to put the book down, when to pick it up. You decide how to engage with line breaks. Um, you're really the one that's navigating that experience. And I think when you go to hear a poet read their work, what you're doing is you're relinquishing that control and you're letting the poet say, this is how I wrote it on the page, yes, but this is also how I hear it in my head and I hear it in my own voice. Um, and so when you hear a poem, I think it's about kind of, again, relinquishing that control that you normally have as a reader and opening yourself up to a little bit more of what, of what the poet's intention was or the poet's um, control. And uh, some of your work, in the stuff that I've read over the past couple of days, um, some of the, is, is formatting the line breaks part of the creation of the poem? Does that come as you are composing it in your mind or is it when you're writing it out by freehand or do you write on a keyboard? How does that whole creative process work? Um, I normally write on a computer, but I do write in lines. Um, I think it takes a while to know what your what a poet's line is and what, what feels natural for you. Um, but for me, I'm really interested in breaking lines in the middle of, of uh, longer units of syntax to create tension, which would then allow you know, a, a line to emerge on its own as sort of this weird fragmentation, um, and yet still exists as part of the longer sentence. And so you get kind of multiple meanings that way. Um, and I like to break lines in such a way that um, helps readers focus their attention, but also that plays with their expectations a little bit and perhaps creates tension in unexpected ways. Is a line break in a poem like a cliffhanger? Like you're getting to the end, you're getting the idea, you're sort of getting the, maybe an idea of the what's being communicated by the poet. And then- I mean, maybe, but, it should, but it, should, it should also exist on its own. It should have meaning, it should be a complete thing. It shouldn't necessarily um, be always a cliffhanger. It should have integrity on its own. Um, but of course that depends on the poet. And the word in German, en jambé, comes from the French to walk over. So certainly that idea of falling, right, of walking over the end of a line into the next line is inherent in line breaks for sure. And do you like reading your own work or after you've written it, you're like, I am done with it. I need to move on. I don't need to reflect on that idea that I've shared. Do I like reading it while I'm revising it or do I like reading it out loud in public? <laughs> well, when you're revising it, when you revise, I'm assuming it's part of your job to read it out loud in public. Yes. So I've got to assume that you enjoy that sort of performance. I, I like working, I like revising, um, because at least when you're revising, you have something to work with and you're not kind of staring down the barrel of the blank page, right? You have you have something to begin with, even if it's not great. Um, and you can kind of begin to work towards seeing what the poem shape is. Um, I don't always love revisiting more complete poems, um, just because I think as you develop as a poet, it becomes so clear to you what you would do now and I think that's dangerous, right? You don't want to, like, I would rewrite my first book probably entirely, but I can't, and that's okay. We just have to let that be, so. Um, also, the, the stuff that um, all poets write is very personal. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, 
Is it more painful for you to read stuff that you've written or is it a catharsis after you have written the things uh, about yourself that you read them later? I think it's, I think it's neither. Um, I think when you're writing, or at least for me, when I'm writing about personal experience, it's always a manipulation. It's always a performance, right? A speaker is always constructed. Um, and the space of the poem is always constructed, even if I'm pulling on my own experience. And then that way, it's a really great assertion of control. Um, that's interesting. I, I'm gonna because the thing you just said caught my attention, and I think that uh, for people experiencing poetry, it, it takes a little bit of working with your mind, getting the muscles of your mind together to be able to experience a poem um, in the way that it's intended by the poet. And there's always a speaker, like you said, with each poem, and that speaker is someone who is telling the reader. Uh, a story, an experience. And so the thing that you just said that caught my attention is you're sort of creating a character that's not you, but it is, but this person is relating experiences that you have had. So there's, there's this detachment when you're writing um, poetry like that? Well, it's just the creation of, an, of, of a new voice, right? So it's, it's channeling whatever sort of aspect of voice is most suited to the poem. Um, so I could write a, a, and I did, I mean, my first book deals a lot with my, my own disability and my father's experience after a fire. Um, and the landscape of the book is totally invented. Um, the events in it are true, but the, the, the actual landscape of it isn't. Um, and for me, that's a way of getting at the material that felt more revelatory, that felt more true, um, without having to be married to the facts of the events themselves. And you have both of your books right there. You can go ahead and show them, show them, show them. To, how how amazing to be able to hold your publishing right it's, in your hand. You wrote those. One. And this is the other one. And that so, one just came out. Yeah, and this is the one I'll, I'll be reading from tonight. I'll be reading from Lethal Theater. And so Lethal Theater, I just read, is from a quote about someone who's writing about uh, the prison experience from prisoners. And that's a lot of what your poems are about in this newest book. And I think I one of the poems that I read that, uh, was a tubal ligation or prisoner's tubal ligation mm -hmm. I'm not sure the title of that which is a longer title but that was pretty harrowing just to read as a poem how did you get your mind around into that place to write this well, book uh, I'm still trying one but two um that that poem it is it, it was called prisoner's tubal ligation with the archangel gabriel and so it became sort of an anti-annunciation poem, right? So instead of, you know, the, the angel Gabriel coming down to announce to Mary that she's going to have Jesus, it's the angel Gabriel coming down as a prison warden announcing to a woman that she's been sterilized against her will. Um, and so a lot of the book draws on biblical tropes, but reverses them to push against the idea of redemptive versus unredemptive suffering. The idea that um, suffering can bring you closer to God, which I, don't believe in our modern age through war or prison, it, it can. Um, and so to get my mind around that poem, I did a lot of research, which is to say that in, in California, as recently as 2013, there were female women prisoners that were sterilized without their consent. This is still very much a part of the fabric of American culture, and what we're doing today. Um, so poetry is a, a force for change in our culture. It sounds like I, you really want to, to use it in that way. Yeah, I mean, I do. I mean, I, I wanted to, more than anything, I wanted to write the book to understand what it is that we do culturally and why we enforce these practices of isolation and interrogation, um, why we did what we did at Abu Ghraib, why we do what we do with lethal injection, um, with black market drugs, and, and the ways in which that has gone horribly awry. Um, and also why we do it out of the public eye, why, we're, why we hide it and sterilize it. Um, that became really interesting to me. And I think that comes out of the fact that I've had a lot of surgery and been in a lot of medical settings. Um, and those are obviously settings that are designed to help you. But what we do in the prison system is take very similar settings, like for lethal injection, and use those as a form of punishment. Um, I became interested in what those spaces share. Were your opinions changed? Do you just feel more enlightened about why those things happen? Or were you more outraged? I mean, I think I've been outraged for a long time, but I think I just became even more aware of how incredibly lucky and privileged I've been to receive the care that I have as a white middle-class American um, and how much my own medical recovery is contingent on the exploitation of black bodies and imprisoned bodies. Um, and that's something the 
history of all medical institutions really needs to deal with. And I think some of them have, but it's something I would, I would really like to talk more about and look more at. And so um, writing like this and sharing your experiences and your ideas like this is a way to make more people think about it and raise some awareness about that and yeah. hopefully be a voice for change. Yeah, I mean, I think we are aware that prisons exist, but not a lot of us spend time in them or, or really think much about what that is um, or what that does and the ways in which it is extremely harmful and, and not a form of rehabilitation. Um, and, and that I think that's become a real point of interest for me. There's a couple of lines um, that your your poems are, there's a lot to unpack in the little, in the few, few words that you put on the page. And so um, in reading them at work and things like that, it's like, I think I'm beginning to get the idea of what's going, but I would have to spend a lot more time. Like there's a poem that you wrote, I forget the, the title of it, but the it was with birds that were coming in and holding, it was just, there was, there was a lot going on. Oh yeah, I do mean from uh, morphine, the recurring Yes, that one, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I just wanted that, so that one, but there was a line from um, another kind of clay mm -hmm. that really grabbed my attention, which was, we can spend our whole lives trying to inhabit our lives. Yes. And I just thought that, it was just lines like that, it's, that's the beauty of poetry. When you read that sort of thing, it's an idea expressed in a way that I may have had, but have never found the words to put it in just that way. Are you surprised sometimes with your own power as a poet? <laughs> I don't think of myself as having any power. <laughs> I think of myself <laughs> a person who's a little obsessive and just writes to, to stay alive. But I am um, I'm always very grateful when anything I've written resonates with someone and if it makes anybody feel slightly less alone or slightly more heard, then, then I feel like that has to, has to matter. Um, so what would you want people to bring tonight? Do you want, should they take some Cookie. time? Cookies. Yeah. Cookies no. and wine. Okay, great. And, that, uh, <laughs> and mentally preparing, should you like relax on the way? Should you listen to music? Like how would you prepare to go to a poetry reading? I mean, do whatever it is that you're doing and just come. And I, I hope that it's a space where people feel open and where people feel or understand that sometimes looking at the hard thing um, and looking closely at, at sort of acts of, of violence or acts of atrocity can be doing the important work. And I hope that they are willing to, to do that looking with me. I, I think they are. I think you're, uh, the audience that comes tonight is in for a real, a real, I'm not going to say a treat <laughs> because I don't think your work is meant to feel like a cupcake, but no. I think that your work is at least the way that it, it uh, affects me. It makes me think about the world around us, how horrible humans can be to each other and the beauty and power of our human spirit. And thank you for letting me think about those things while I engage with your work. You're welcome, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for taking some time out of your day. I hope you enjoy your visit in Fairbanks. And well, absolutely, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for making time for me and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Oh, what's so, this is, a, quick before we go. So you've got two books published. You have another book coming out next year. Mm -hmm. so, there, so there's plenty of stuff. There's plenty of Susanna Nevinson out there for people to enjoy. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.